Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. I hope that you're doing well and that you had a lovely weekend. Uh, it was a long one, four day weekend. Um, I had a very good weekend and well, I'm enjoying being back, but there's a lot of excitement in my life because my wife and I are expecting our first baby and we got some news. The baby's healthy, very excited to, to know that everything is, is on the up and up. And uh, yeah, so life goes on, but we're really excited. And we found that news out, I think on Thursday. So um, we're dealing with cabinets and I'm very much with you and I'm ready to go, but we just have like a lot of activity and excitement and you know naturally it's just uh it's a big a big event so yeah you are one of my favorite classes and i'll tell you that honestly and you're always so nice and it's always so fun to come in here that i felt like i wanted to share this information because it makes me very happy and um well we're just very happy so yeah um Okay, <laughs> let's get going. Although I can see that there is some activity in the chat. Let's take a look. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks everybody. It's seriously so exciting. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Haley, we don't have a name yet, so we don't know the sex yet. Uh, but we'll probably find out next week. And we do have some names that we like, and we've got some lists that we've made, but we um, will probably wait to see. And our preferences have sort of changed from month to month, but I think I know what I want. <laughs> no, I'm not nervous at all, Efren. I couldn't be more excited. I'm so proud <laughs> and so excited. But Yes, okay. I'll give you all updates as we go along. We'll know a little bit more like probably every week. So, okay, we're dealing with cabinets. And, you know, this is an interesting topic because the truth is when we talk about democracy, we usually don't talk about the executive. The executive is sort of the, the ultimate authoritative institution because the legislature and the judiciary are sort of set up to check the power of the executive. And so when we talk about democracy, how we restrain the power of the executive or how we set up the executive and its relationship with, with other branches matters a great deal because often it's a matter of parceling out the power of the executive and handing it over to some of the other institutions. So for example, we saw that in early modern England, the, the parliament obtained the power to authorize expenditure from the crown and that this was a sort of uh, devolution of power, if you will, from the crown to the, the legislature. But the executive and the cabinet still has a lot of important implications for democracy, especially when it comes to how power is distributed <clears throat> and how the cabinet is assembled in the, the process, the political process leading up to the, the creation of the cabinet itself. And so there are two perspectives. And one of those perspectives comes from James Madison, who said that when the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or in the same body of magistrates, there can be no liberty. And so what he was saying is that presidential democracy is the one and the only. And he was suggesting that this separation of powers and this checks and balances that results from presidential democracy is essential because the alternative, this all powerful prime minister who presides over this legislative majority is, is undemocratic. But that's just one perspective and if you go to Africa and you talk with Africanists or scholars of African politics, they're less sure. And they may say something like this, a high degree of presidential power, that is a separation of the executive 
in the legislature bodes ill for democracy and, and good governance in Africa. And in Africa, it's much more common that you get ruling presidents and presidents who remain in power for decades and treat the executive and the in, in the political system like, you know, like a, a throne, if you will, and, and one that that doesn't enjoy the the power to to check or 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 balance the executive. And so Latin America, Africa seems to suggest that presidentialism might be less democratic. James Madison and the framers argued that presidentialism is more democratic. The ways that presidentialism and parliamentarism differ are more numerous than just this difference between a concentration of power or a separation of power between the executive and the legislature. It also has to do with, with the way in which power is distributed or shared within the cabinet itself. And the key question for us, in addition to this question of, of parliamentarism versus presidentialism, is, is how they differ in terms of the distribution of power and the assembly of, of the cabinet. And it really is a difference between concentrating power and dispersing or sharing power. And so let's go ahead and begin to think more about this as we, as we work through this and consider this key question of whether concentrating or sharing power in the executive is, is more conducive to democracy. Remember that when we think about these institutions, we're thinking about them as features of democracy, but also as, as independent variables, right? As, as potential causes of democratic progress or even democratic decline. And this is what we'll do again this week. And this is our focus for this week then, these issues of the distribution of power and the concentration or sharing of power in the choice of, of executive institutions. As we embark on this, I, I want to tell you up front that some of this may be review. And if it is, uh, I apologize. I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence, but there are some basics that we need to just refresh on and make sure that we're clear on uh, as we get going, because there are some important technical distinctions that will frame this discussion. And so as we get started, let's begin by thinking of the issues in terms of a series of types. When we think about the executive and when we think about the institutions of democracy, we can distinguish between presidential, parliamentary, and mixed democracies. And these differ in terms of the relationship between the, the government, or that is the cabinet, the legislature, and the president, if there is one. And you'll see that the precise difference relates to the distribution of power between them and whether they are separately uh, or, or I guess simultaneously elected. So a presidential democracy is a democracy where the government does not depend on the legislative majority to exist. What that means then is that voters directly elect or they vote for the election of the president. They also vote for the election of their legislator or legislators and those are separate elections. It is not the case that they vote for a legislator or legislators and that the legislative majority then anoints a prime minister or the executive. That is a parliamentary democracy. In a presidential democracy, there is a separate election where the government does not depend on that legislative majority. And so that presidency, the executive, is understood as distinct from the legislature. It is a separate institution. It is the executive. It is independent of the legislature. The head of government and the head of state are fused. They handle military and security and and other issues of policy, each of which has a ministry or a department of the executive. And the presidency is a winner-take-all position. What that means is that 
the president or the elected president or the, I guess, anointed president, if you indirectly elect them like you do in the United States, composes the cabinet. The president decides who goes in that cabinet, not the legislature, not the legislative majority, not the parties that share power, the president. The president chooses who goes in that cabinet. And this is because they are separately elected. Because they are separately elected, they alone decide who goes in their cabinet. And the executive or the presidency in this regard is a winner take all position. The president and the legislators are fixed are elected for a fixed term. For the president, that can be four or six or more years. And the president is directly elected by the voters, or at least directly elected by electors elected by the voters, <laughs> um, or, or uh, voted for by the, the voters. We have an indirect election system in the US. And so clearly, you can see that there are, are, are deviations. But the point is that we directly vote for the eventual president. This is a system where the president decides who goes in the cabinet. It has a great deal of discretion uh, about what the cabinet will look like and, and what the executive will look like. There are 28 of these systems in the world. Most of them are in Latin America where 15 of them can be found. They also exist in Africa in large numbers. There's only one of them in Europe. Most of Europe's systems are parliamentary democracies. There are some important variations within presidentialism. The length of the presidential term can vary from four to six years. The number of consecutive terms allowed can also vary. For example, in Mexico, there's a one term limit. In Chile, you can't serve consecutive terms but you can serve multiple terms. There are plurality elections where you simply must win a plurality of the vote, as well as majoritarian runoffs where the eventual winner of a majority is elected. Now, as I said, presidents have several roles. Because it's a winner take all position, Presidents by themselves pick their cabinets, okay? I cannot emphasize how important this is. Presidents pick their cabinets, and this is a feature of presidential systems that concentrates power. Because when you say, now that you've been elected, you compose the executive, what we're doing is we're essentially entrusting them to compose an executive or an institution of democracy that will resemble what we have voted for in them, okay? The president gets to choose and exercise that discretion. It's not the legislature, it's not anyone else, it's the president. What that means then is it's a winner take all position. You win that office, you pick your cabinet. Similarly, the president also chairs the cabinet meetings. They have legislative powers, these can vary by country, but the president always has, for instance, the power to introduce the budget, various powers that might relate to veto power and the rejection of bills passed by another chamber, agenda power or the power to set the terms or the priorities on the legislative agenda they also have decree powers in many cases where they can use executive authority to decree legislation without the participation of the legislature. Now, in a parliamentary system, these powers don't exist to the same extent and the system is very, very different. And you'll see how that plays out here in a moment. But the key point is that the cabinet or the executive in a presidential system is a winner take all position. The president picks their cabinet, assembles that government, if you will. 
And in turn, they wield power over that cabinet and that executive. And they use that institution of government to exercise legislative powers that can include or, or vary, um, but normally include veto power, agenda power, and, and some decree powers. Yes, Uriel, in the United States, the cabinet members must be approved by Senate. But it's important to keep in mind that normally this is sort of, it's, it's normally depoliticized. It's, it hasn't been until recently that the prospect of rejecting nominations became a real threat. Normally it's been kind of an informal rule of the, of the game that presidents pick their cabinets and then those cabinet ministers are approved. But in the United States and elsewhere, um, and normally in presidential systems, those cabinet appointees do require the approval of at least one um, chamber of, of the legislature. Now, I'm actually forgetting whether in Argentina, for example, you need the full approval of the Senate or just the approval of a certain committee. I'm pretty sure it's the full Senate whose approval you need. And sometimes that can be difficult for presidents to obtain. And so sometimes it is difficult for them to, to constitute their cabinet as they would wish. Uh, and that's an important thing for us to think about when we think about the powers of the executive. They can be rejected. It's, it, it's not uh, a formality anymore. It used to be more of a formality, but remember that President Obama, for example, he went like years at a time without heads to some, for some of his agencies because he wasn't able to obtain approval, uh, primarily because of divided government and Republican control of the Senate. And so it's not a formality. And in many cases, when politics becomes involved, uh, opposition parties will deny a president uh, approval. Now, I think the key for us to remember is that there's been a great deal of, of new polarization in recent decades. And so it hasn't been no the, normally the case that those appointees were denied approval, um, but it is always a possibility. And so it's not necessarily just a formality. And um, I think it's also interesting to note that during President Trump's administration, there were a number of, of nominations who were not approved, but not necessarily for political reasons. It was because they were literally identified to have been incompetent and not able to run the, 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 um, the departments that they were slated to run uh, as, as appointees. But the key that I want to, to emphasize also is that there's also a political component. So if your nominees are to be approved, it helps to be a strong president. And that means having a legislative majority in the Congress or a party majority in the Congress that is compliant, disciplined, and obedient, and that will approve your nominees. Now, I'm sure that you can all can imagine a situation like the example of the Obama administration that I just gave, where a relatively weak president or a weaker president lacks a majority in one or both houses of Congress and is unable to obtain the approval of their nominees and is unable to, to round out either their cabinet or the top posts, the top ranks of key divisions within departments of the executive branch. So the balance of power can vary considerably from administration to administration and from election to election and from country to country and from time period to time period. And I'm gonna show you some data here in a moment that, that illustrates this, but there's, there's some activity here in the chat. Let me see what's going on. Yeah, Christopher points out that during Obama's administration, it was often motivated by partisanship. Um, and this was often quite blatant. But there is a role for presidential strength. And when we talk about presidential strength, we mean the capacity of the president to shape legislative outcomes. And this is 
understood in terms of the size of their legislative constituency, right? The size of the legislative coalition. We can think of really a spectrum where on one side we have stronger presidents and on another side we have weaker presidents. Stronger presidents are gonna have a single party majority. They might have a majority coalition that is filled up by two parties or maybe three. A weaker president is going to have a single party minority or a minority coalition. And what you'll notice is that in Latin America, in the countries that I have in our data set here, most of the presidents had a majority coalition or a minority coalition. What that tells us is that in most Latin American countries, presidents weren't necessarily that strong. They were somewhere between relatively strong and relatively weak. Those presidents that had a minority coalition or a coalition that involved two or more parties and did, did not form a majority were the weakest. In only a few cases in Latin American countries in this data set, did presidents have a single party majority during the period from the 1970s to 2000. In the United States, a total of five cases during this period, two of which were single party majorities, one of which was a majority coalition, two of which were single party major minorities, and zero of which were minority coalitions. You see then that there's quite a bit of variation. On the whole, presidents in Latin America were somewhere between weaker and, and relatively strong. On the whole, they were sort of in the middle, in other words. In the United States, by contrast, they were more concentrated on the stronger side. But what this shows you is that there's a lot of variation in terms of the actual strength of presidents. Those presidents that are weaker, those presidents that are weaker are also going to have a harder time getting their cabinet appointees confirmed because they don't have a compliant legislative majority in Congress. They have a number of parties opposite their party whose consent they must obtain and who may say, for instance, I don't like that nominee. We, let's, we should discuss some alternatives. Those stronger presidents are in a much better position to get the approval of their nominees because in the situation where a single party majority can be relied on, well, it's sort of like a formality at that point because it's going to be the same party or a party that's entered into a coalition with the president. And there's going to be some negotiation or some agreement that they will provide support maybe in exchange for uh, the president's support for their policy priorities that can maybe be pursued later on down the road. So the strength of the president measured in terms of the size of the coalition and the size of the, the partisan contingent is going to impact their ability to obtain the approval of their cabinet nominees. So in Costa Rica, the reason that we see stronger presidents is because in Costa Rica, they have a, a two-party system during most of this period. And that has a lot to do with their electoral institutions. I won't go into it, but basically in Costa Rica, two large parties duped it out and fought for seats. Uh, because the majoritarian institutions tended to penalize small parties and incentivize voting for large parties. So over the years in Costa Rica, two parties emerged. Eventually in the 2000s, Costa Rica fragmented a little bit into a, a three or a four party system. But during this period, it was largely the case that, that two parties filled out the Congress. And so as a result, it was common for Costa Rican presidents to have the support of a single party majority. Um, but it was equally common for them to 
have the support of only a single party minority, in which case the opposition party controlled the Congress. Presidential strength then becomes really important when, it be, when, it, when we're discussing the, the power of, of a president to obtain the confirmation of their, their, their appointees. Similarly, if you consider the composition of the cabinet in these presidential systems, what you'll notice is that those countries where presidents on the whole were weaker, in turn, also exhibit a higher average percentage of nonpartisan ministers, precisely because in order to form a coalition, these presidents needed to basically give cabinet posts to elites in other parties. And so in countries like Ecuador, where every single coalition involved three or four or more parties, you see a very high percentage of nonpartisan cabinet ministers. That means that even in this presidential system, presidents have to give posts to nonpartisan legislators or nonpartisan politicians as part of the, the process of forming a coalition that can be used to govern. And so the lower the percentage, the stronger the presidents were. So in countries like Costa Rica, where I said two parties fought for seats and two parties were the main parties for about 30 years, percentage is very, very low. So that means the presidents typically had free reign to form their cabinets based on politicians from their parties. In Ecuador, by contrast, where you had many, many more parties and where the presidents consequently were much weaker, you had a much higher percentage of nonpartisan ministers, much weaker presidents in turn. And so even though presidents pick their cabinets, there could be substantial variation in the composition of the cabinet based upon the strength of that president in Congress. This is an important difference because as you'll see, composition of the cabinet becomes important and becomes relevant to policymaking. So in the United States, the reason that we have zero as the percentage of nonpartisan ministers is because um, in our system in the United States, First of all, the executive does not need the support of a legislative majority to survive. And it's not customary for the governing party to form a, a coalition with the opposition party in order to govern. That's not customary. And so because it's not customary for these coalitions to form, you also don't see um, any nonpartisan ministers in the cabinets in the United States. If it was customary and, and necessary, say for the Democrats or the Republicans to get those, those votes or get that extra support to form that coalition, you might see a larger percentage. But customarily, that's not how it works because the Democrats and the Republicans don't work together. Um, it's more likely that, that maybe one party would would try to peel away a few of the votes of the other party um, on a on a piece by piece basis, on a on a law by law basis, and and that wouldn't require a substantial a substantial sort of apportioning of minister positions in the cabinet. No, Jeffrey, it doesn't really depend on how big the cabinet is. The cabinet is a winner take all position. So, you know, regardless of what size the cabinet is, it's, it's, it's composed by the, the president, right? And so even if the president is sort of effectively forced to put nonpartisan ministers in their cabinet, they're still gonna be the one picking who those nonpartisans are right? It's not going to be someone else. You know, maybe there could be some negotiation or some bargain that goes on, but it's ultimately that president who determines who's in that cabinet. In a parliamentary system, by contrast, the prime minister is himself or herself 
really a product of a process of bargaining or negotiation that also produces or composes the cabinet um, in addition to, to anointing who the prime minister is. So the cabinet formation is very different in presidential versus parliamentary systems. So let's take an example of a presidential system. That example is Chile. I've given you the example of Chile before to show you how weak the legislature is. But the opposite side of the coin is, is how strong the, the presidency is and how strong the executive is. And so the executive in Chile is, is headed by the president. It is directly elected, serves a four-year term and not eligible for consecutive reelection. The powers of the president include ex the exclusive right to introduce legislation, oversee the, the courts, and the power to demand a session of Congress or a plebiscite even. And the cabinet ministers are appointed by the president and must approve all decrees or regulations. And so the president has a lot of power, beginning with the power to appoint their cabinet ministers, who do require legislative approval, um, but ordinarily are, are, are approved. Now, recently in the United States, the, the composition of Joe Biden's cabinet has been a topic of, of debate and a, a topic of, of consideration for the media and consideration for us as we keep an eye on what they do and, and what plans they have as they as they manage the, the social and the economic and the political crisis that, that we meet. And so these confirmation hearings did begin very early on. And immediately the attention shifted to uh, the composition of the cabinet, who would be in there and, and who wouldn't be in there. And so let's watch a video that puts this in perspective and helps us to get a sense of how much control the president exerts over the process of, of assembling the cabinet. And I, again, I want you to focus on who's in charge here. It's the executive, it's the president who makes these decisions, even as he waits on the Senate approval needed to, to go forward with, with composing this cabinet. So let's watch this video after I pause. The That's an interesting video because not only does it show the power of the elected president to determine who those nominees are, but it also talks about how the politics comes into play and how presidential strength will impact uh, the success or the failure of those nominations in, in those Senate confirmation hearings. Everything from the approval of those nominees to the, the when they're approved and, and whether they're approved quickly or not. And so the politics and the, the strength of the president based on their, their legislative majority or their lack thereof in the Senate is, is a really important part of the, the picture. <clears throat> so then we distinguish a presidential system from a parliamentary one. And a parliamentary one is a democracy where the government depends on a legislative majority to exist. This is a system where voters vote for legislators and a legislative majority that forms after the election then anoints the executive or anoints or selects the prime minister uh, which forms the government. This is very, very different than a presidential system where we directly elect the legislators and the president. So in a parliamentary system, there are two positions. There's the head of government and the head of state. The head of government is not chosen directly by the voters. It's selected by the legislature, which is selected by the voters. The, the cabinet is a collegial body. And this is different than in a presidential system where the president or the executive selects the cabinet nominees in this system, in a parliamentary system, the cabinet is a product of the negotiations and the bargains that take place within the legislative majority. So in a sense, 
the prime minister in the cabinet over which the prime minister presides, they're all a product of the negotiation that takes place within the legislative majority that forms through the election. Voters don't vote for a president who then choose, chooses those nominees. Voters vote for the legislators and the legislat legislature, the, the majority in that legislature then selects the cabinet in, which includes the prime minister. This is a very different logic. This is a logic of sharing power, right? This is a logic of cooperation and coordination within the legislative coalition or the legislative majority that forms as a result of the election. And this winner take all logic in the presidential system is really cast aside and replaced with more of a, a collegial, cooperative, coordinated logic where there's more of a focus on cooperation and negotiation and sharing power within a governing coalition. Now that government, that cabinet, which consists of the prime minister and that set of cabinet appointees chosen by the legislature, then in turn needs the confidence of that same parliament to survive. And so that executive in sharing power internally needs to maintain the confidence of the parliament that determined the composition of that cabinet and executive in the first place. Very different than a presidential system. In the parliamentary system, we vote for the legislature and that's it. And it's the legislative majority that then picks the cabinet and the executive. In a presidential system, we vote for the president and the legislature. And it's the president that we elect that then picks that cabinet. Very different implications, very different system. And as you know, in a parliamentary system, that government formed by that cabinet and that prime minister can fall through a motion of no confidence. Now there are 76 of these in the world and these 76 systems make it the most common political system. It's pre predominant in Western Europe, but it's also very present in areas colonized by, by Britain, like Australia, Canada, India, New Zealand, South Africa. And these slides will be available later. And so if you weren't able to get everything there, don't, don't fret. Uh, I wanna bring your attention to the example of Ghana and show you that oftentimes the, the form of democracy taken uh, does relate to the British or the, the, the other colonial legacy left behind in, in a modern day country. And so those places that Britain colonized often set up parliamentary democracy and parliamentary institutions. Uh, other types of, of colonies were, were set up differently and appointed differently with different kinds of, of, of institutions. But the difference between parliamentary and presidential democracy really can be understood fundamentally as a difference between concentrating and sharing power when it comes to the executive institutions. And, and really we're putting aside the legislature and we're thinking about really the difference between presidential democracy and a power concentrating executive where a directly elected executive composes the cabinet themselves into parliamentary democracy where power is shared within a cabinet, shared among a prime minister and cabinet ministers who are selected as part of a negotiation within a legislative majority that forms through a, a legislative election. These are important differences. Now to illustrate and to see what this looks like, this process of cabinet formation through the legislative majority, as opposed to through the appointments of a president, let's take a look at uh, an example from, from Kuwait, which is the most democratic of the Gulf countries. It's still partly free. It's only, only partly free. It's not a, a, a perfect democracy by any stretch, but it's one that we don't talk about perhaps very much. Let's take a look at the way that the cabinet is composed or selected by the legislative majority in Kuwait. 
Meanwhile, the Kuwaiti cabinet ministers have handed in their resignations to the Prime Minister, Sheikh Sabah, days after the opposition lawmakers submitted a motion asking to question the Premier over issues including the makeup of the cabinet. The resignations were forced after a majority of lawmakers backed a request to question the Prime Minister, a move that could have led to his dismissal or Parliament's dissolution. The cabinet formed after parliamentary elections last month was the second that the Prime Minister has headed in less than a year. Tensions mounted during the Kuwaiti Parliament's first session when the incumbent speaker was re-elected, which was open to both elected legislators and cabinet ministers as well. The lawmakers also claim that the cabinet formation is not reflective of the poll results. The opposition lawmakers allege that the speaker's re-election was due to government intervention and that they threatened to question the prime minister about it. The ruling family and the government is now facing increasing calls for a radical political reform from the opposition. The fresh political turmoil comes at a time when the conservative state is dealing with an economic slowdown due to lower oil prices, the COVID-19 pandemic and stalled reforms. Kuwait has the most open political system in the Gulf region, with the parliament wielding power to pass legislation and question ministers, although the ruling Al-Sabah family controls most of the senior posts. So it's very different. It's a difference between the president or the executive composing the cabinet and the legislature or the legislative majority composing the cabinet. And this has very different implications for democracy because we're really distinguishing between the concentration of power and the sharing of power. And that's a, a difference that it cannot be resolved. It's a, an irreconcilable difference, a fundamental difference, a different approach to democracy. And on Friday, we will discuss in more detail some cases and some examples. We'll take a look at how different types of executives affect the prospects for democracy. But today, we still have a moment left. And I'd like us to kind of sit back and address some of the issues that come up and talk about some of the issues that, that maybe are the most important here. And I think the question that I have for you is, on the face of it, are we better off concentrating power or, or sharing power in the executive? Do you think that the presidential approach in the way that it empowers the executive, do you think that that is advantageous? Or do you think that the sort of parliamentary approach in the way that it empowers the legislative majority is advantageous? From the perspective of promoting democracy, promoting accountability, promoting representation, Um, was that a question? Just me? Yes, it was. Oh, okay. I'll just go quickly then. Um, I think the, the presidential system is more like, has a more advantageous because like it gives the, um, basically the, it has like a distinction between um, like the, I'm blinking out, sorry. I literally had two hours of sleep. Um, But it, there's a, separation of the legislative and executive and also like the um, legislative is not in charge of like deciding like like which roles it plays instead like the executive has like it's like specific goals I hope that made sense and so, so letting the executive have, have specific goals helps to promote democracy yeah it's like it's like the executive should have like its own separate rules while the legislative should also focus on other rules and such as like um, not letting like who will like not suppressing like voters of like who um, who will be like in charge of like 
certain aspects of government, also like the executives being in charge of like its policies and also like what like what it thinks is best for the country. Okay. So Christopher says confirmation used for partisan purposes loses its value. Um, somehow we need more coalition groups, which means more parties. But don't you think it might be more difficult, Christopher, to get confirmation of your, your nominees if there are more parties? Because it might actually be harder to satisfy all those different groups if they all can play kingmaker, right? Uriel says, I think it's dangerous to give the executive power to just one individual. There needs to be checks and balances of some sort. So Uriel seems to be suggesting that, that Efren's suggestion that presidential power is better might be misplaced. I'm wondering if giving the legislature the, the capacity to, to decide on the composition of the, of the cabinet I wonder if that helps to improve or, or, or enhance representation, for example. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything of that sort. Kayana says parliamentary system. Jeffrey says, it's better to have the president independent, but as long as there are major delegative powers put in the hands of the legislature. So Jeffrey suggests that, look, you want your independent executive. You want them to be able to nominate a cabinet that is of their choosing, but you also want to limit their authority and you want to delegate substantial power to the legislature. Interesting, interesting. So maybe there's a way of having the best of both worlds. I'm wondering if Jeffrey and others would suggest that the parliamentary approach, sharing power in the cabinet would, would undermine democracy? Is that too fragmented? Do you think that that's too unfocused? Um, I'm wondering if there are any ideas there. Yes, Christopher, coalitions compromise, but coalition formation gets harder as the number of parties increases. And so compromise is, is not guaranteed and coalitions are more difficult to form and they survive for shorter periods of time if, if they are more unwieldy. And so this is, this is um, a, one of the realities of, of politics. Sasha says, I don't think that the individual executive should have all the power. It should be shared among others, not just one person though. Okay, so maybe the sharing of power in the legislature helps to enhance representation or maybe is, is better for accountability. Maybe if we associate the legislature with parties, and if we control parties, maybe there's, there's a way that, that uh, the legislature helps to enhance democracy if, if it has some role in composing the cabinet. Uriel says that it, it, it is always going to be difficult to settle this question because ideologies will always get in the way. What I'm hearing from a lot of you is that it may sort of depend on the country, right? <laughs> in the, the informal nature of politics and how much polarization may or may not exist in the system and whether or not partisanship, as you, as you sort of call it, gets in the way of, of governing and making those decisions that, that must be made, right? In the, in, the, in the heat of the moment or in response to crisis. And I think that, you know, there may be somewhere in the middle, right? And, and really the precise powers that we give to these different institutions, it may be a question of, of, of finding the right balance given the circumstances and, and maybe other factors that, that don't relate uh, directly to these institutions. Like, you know, how many political parties or how many social and political cleavages are there in the society? And, and is it possible to, to, to uh, share power in a way that is, is helpful to democracy or is it, is it better for us to concentrate power in the hands of, of the executive? Per, perhaps because there are, are few parties and it makes more sense to, to organize society this way. These are questions that we'll address in greater detail on, on Friday. And I look forward to looking at some more cases with you and taking on the question of, of how these differences matter and, and how they impact democratic survival and progress uh, or decline.
So thanks everybody for being here. I'm going to stop the recording and um, I'll see you Friday.